Shalom, everyone. This is our third class of learning ancient Hebrew. And uh, we will today we will be looking at nouns and pronouns specifically. So one interesting thing for Hebrew with nouns is that, well, before I say that, I'll, I'll say it this way. So many ancient languages have something called cases, or it's also referred to as declensions, where they have, well, declensions is, is like different types of cases, but um, like in Greek and Latin, for example, there are cases. Now, basically what case means is a function of a noun, and it's divided primarily into three cases, Greek and Latin, do it like five cases or sometimes even more than that. But it's like pretty much usually like five. And so the case, that, but the three primary cases are nominative, nominative, which means basically the subject, the noun is the subject of a sentence. The, the object or the objective case, so the object, the noun that is the object in a sentence or a clause. And then there's something called the genitive case. That would be a possessive noun. So anything that belongs to something else is a possess, uh, the, what it belongs to, that is the possessive. The owner is the possessive uh, noun. And so, uh, in English, we actually accomplished this by doing special ending, uh, special letter endings similar to cases. So uh, we actually say apostrophe s to signify that it belongs to something. So that is an actual ending that signifies genitive. So say. Um, Son of God, right? Son of God, that phrase. Well, to put it in a genitive case, it would be God's son. So God is in the genitive case because the son is of God. So instead of saying of all the time, we can use the case ending. And that's how many ancient languages work where the, the case ending occurs. Now there is evidence that originally in Hebrew, there was cases, there were cases, case endings. And this is preserved in Akkadian. And remember last week, I explained how Akkadian is very close to the ancient form of Hebrew that existed at that time. Hebrew was much closer to the Akkadian than we realize, than a lot of people realize. So the original Hebrew had these case marking distinctions, but over time, in all languages, cases start to disappear. Okay. And so basically, uh, just like it happened in English, Akkadian lost cases over time as well. And the same thing happened with Hebrew, but for Hebrew, it happened much earlier. With Akkadian, the cases survived for a much longer time. Now, obviously, we're not here to learn English, but I'm just going to show you guys what it looks like for English. We go back to the, uh, we will go back to the old English, and I'm going to, we're just going to give you an example of how, how cases work. And then I'm going to translate that into Hebrew. Translate in the sense of convey it in Hebrew. Uh, so, let me just pull it up here. And then I'll share my screen with you guys. All right, so this is a good example. Let's 
see now it's working. Last time it wouldn't let me show the, the windows. All right, let's see. Just about to share the page, hold on. Right. So can you guys see the screen being shared? I'll zoom in if it lets me. All right, whoops. So here we have an old English. You guys can see this, right? Someone's, yeah, okay. Walter, thank you. Uh, so uh, old English, the word for dog was hound, spelled hund, H-U-N-D, okay? So the Subject, you spelled it hound or hun. And the it's also called accusative, the object. Okay. And so they also spell it the same way. Genitive was spelled es. Instead of apostrophe, they use the e as well. So es. And then dative is also similar to the object. It's basically indirect object. You might have heard in grammar there's direct object and indirect object. Well, originally direct and indirect were covered by the same case in original Hebrew, but uh, in many languages, the cases distinguish between the direct object and the indirect object. And you'll see in, in the plural has a similar thing. So instead of like in English, we just say S, right? To make it a plural. Well, uh, in Old English, you had AS for some of these words to signify it's a subject or an object, direct object. And instead of saying apostrophe S, you would often say A at the end if it's a plural, Hounda or Hunda. And then the dative is Hundum. So, and then it gives also the example of the word for ship, spelled S-C-I-P, and the word for house, spelled H-U-S. And you can see it's the same basic concept there. All right. And let's see. And there's different, uh, different things with that. So anyway, that was Old English. Of course, we are not learning Old English, so I will get away from but uh, so originally, let me pull up the the uh, keyboard here. Actually, I have to type this out for you guys. I'm going to share the screen again. Now, keep in mind that when I say original Hebrew, I am meaning a, a ancient dialect of Akkadian or a similar language to Akkadian, but that is the origin of Hebrew because there were several dialects in ancient times similar to Akkadian, like there was Eblaite and the Canaanite Akkadian. And those are basically the ancestors of Hebrew. So, and I'll, I'll cite an example of that evidence that it is the ancestor of Hebrew. But so with that as the backdrop, so you can understand what I mean when I say original Hebrew. So in that original Hebrew, we have the following four cases.
All right, so I'm sharing the screen again. And so we have here the example that the scholars use is the word for king. For in Akkadian, they use the word for king, which is sar in Akkadian. Uh, so So this, for the masculine, you, you know how, uh, well, maybe you guys don't know, because it depends your level of knowledge of, of Hebrew. But so in plural, in, in Hebrew, the plural is yod mem, or I am. And so, like, for example, melakim is the, is the normal word for kings in Hebrew. Melek singular is king singular king but to make it a plural to make it more than one king kings you add the yod mem and for basically any masculine noun to the singular you add the yod mem and that makes it uh, a plural well in in original hebrew you added mem as the ending for like everything. And that was considered, a, it's called mimation. And so if it, if it was an object, it was uh, let me see, I, I'll, do, I'll do the English as well. So you can see what the, uh, so scholars say that it was, Sarum for the subject or, uh, yeah, so the nominative or the subject case. So if you want the, su the subject of a noun, uh, excuse me, of a sentence, uh, if you want the noun to be the subject, uh, in original Hebrew, you would have the mem after it. If you wanted it to be an object in the sentence, like saying, uh, doing something to a noun or, or like, um, for example, uh, hugging the noun, that would be a direct object. Doing something to an object, that's an indirect object. But so in either case, if it's an object, it originally would have been saram with with a a and then finally for the genitive which is of something it would be sarim or sarim and um, this, uh, again, it means of the king. And then the plural, now this is unusual for the plural, it is saru. for both the subject and the object, but for, um, but for the uh, genitive, it's, it's E, okay? Now I'm explaining you, to you guys how it used to be. That's not gonna really help you in uh, speaking Hebrew, right? but it helps you understanding the origins of the, the evolution of the language. And so you see, this is what it used to be, and then it became this. So that's why I'm explaining this. So this is all masculine nouns, okay? And also the dual. The dual is, I believe it is, um, Uh, 
I have to double check, uh, but I think it's I think it's uh, Sarun and Sarin, and that is a subject on, of a or an object of a sentence, and a genitive dual is Sarin. So if you were if you if you were to say um, let's say for example teeth or tooth. Um, actually, we'll, we'll do hands. Oops. Right. So the word for hand in Hebrew is yod or yad. And plural, making it plural would be yod, yodim. But dual would be yadim. Or yadum. So if you're if you're saying uh, let's see uh, my the fingers the fingers of my hands. So then you would you would say uh, you would use yadin because it's it's a genitive. But if you're saying your hands, uh, like as a subject, your hands did something, then it would be the first one. It would be the, sub the nominative case. Um, so that's how it works for the, the uh, masculine. The feminine works similarly. But instead, you have, I'm going to copy and paste this because it's basically the same thing. But instead, it is Sar uh, Sartam. Sartam, Sartim, but then this is where it differs. It's it's a uh, Sarutam and Sarutim, and then I think it's. Uh, um, I'd have to double check the dual. I'm not as familiar with the dual form, so I will double check that. But um, but I know for a fact uh, the, these first ones are correct. So what's interesting is the mem is at the end all the time in feminine, whereas in the masculine, it's only in the singular, but it's not in the plural. But the, the weird thing is in Hebrew, it's the reverse. In Hebrew, instead of the mem in the singular, it has mem only in the plural. So that's a strange phenomenon. That's not exactly clear why, how that switch happened. Um, I theorize that maybe mem did used to also be there because just like just like the feminine, it, like it's it's after it's after each one, so it would make sense that it's also after each one in the original Hebrew. So if it was after each one in the original Hebrew, maybe it was something like like this, and then and then maybe uh, this or something. But like I said, uh, currently Akkadian doesn't have the mem in the plural, whereas Hebrew does. So that's one difference that is strange. Um, but so what happened to, with, with Hebrew? So basically the case, like I said, the case ending is dropped. So you get rid of the, you get rid of the mem and
and then we'll get rid of the dual because the dual complicates it. Because dual basically we didn't they didn't use the dual much eventually in Hebrew. It fell into disuse. It used to be used in Hebrew, but because it wasn't uh, as necessary, people stopped using it. So the case disappears. Um, but for the plural, it becomes, it, the, the mem is added and the, and this is also made into a, a mem. Now, some early Hebrew have just a mem without a yod, which is interesting. So it may be that the plural originally was something along the lines of Sarum or Saram. But with all that said, the way Hebrew currently is, the plural, like biblical Hebrew, the plural is Yod Mem for all cases. And likewise, the singular, this is from Asklem again, uh, the, sing the singular has no ending. It's just the word. And for feminine, now, what feminine is interesting is that it, it, it has, uh, let's, you, let's use um, malak. Actually, we can, we can use sar because that, that, that's where Sarah comes from, actually. The name Sarah comes from princess. And so we have uh Sarah and then more than one princess would be princesses that would be oat and anytime you make a plural of a feminine in Hebrew it has the oat ending for example spirits if you have one spirit it's ruach if you have multiple spirits it is ruachot the ending oat and for queens, it's melakot. So, but there is something very interesting that Hebrew does, which also happens in Akkadian, the, the original Hebrew. It has something called a construct state. So you might be thinking, if, if Hebrew doesn't have case markers, how do we know when it's talking about a subject, an object, or a uh, genitive? Well, what's interesting is that there are some. There's something called. Uh, it's called a construct state or in construction. So, if you want to say, "Son of God." Um, it looks like uh, Jeremiah has to go, so, but uh, I appreciate Jeremiah for coming on, and I apologize once again for the delay in the time of uh, trying to set up the live stream. It didn't work this time, but like I said, next week, hopefully, we will get it to work. So, um, if you're saying son of God, in Hebrew, you would say, Son, you would say Ben L, and so that is rendered as Son God, right? So, is it saying the way the way it's in Hebrew? It's ambiguous. It could be saying. It's a divine, whoops, it's a divine son, right? So in Hebrew, adjectives come after the noun. So, oh, and by the way, Hebrew is right to left. I can't remember if I told you guys that in the first two meetings. So we're reading right to left. So 
This is the first word. Ben, which means son. Second word, El, means, means God. An adjective comes after. So it could mean divine son. But most of the time, if you see Ben El, it's not going to mean divine son. It's going to mean son of God. But in the, in, um, actually, though, I, I, I will rephrase that because um, in Hebrew, you see son of man, son of Adam. That, that means a human son. So it actually, I'm correcting myself, it actually, does really mean a divine son um but in it like contextually though it's not an adjective most of the time most of the time it's a construct state and so construct state basically would be along the lines of like a imagine there's an arrow there okay so this is a construct state. So it's basically the, the connector basically means of. So imagine you're typing it as if it's one word rather than two words. When, when you have two nouns together like that, it can be combined to form a special connection. And that connection becomes a phrase the first noun is the subject or the object. The second noun is the genitive. And, uh, oh, Melissa, you were gonna ask a question? It, says, it looks like you said you got it right, but you wanna say it anyway? Yeah, I was just gonna say I got it right. Ding, 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 ding. What, what, what did you think? Like, what, I said what? it was Ben Elohim, but then I realized it was L because isn't Elohim plural? Yeah. So basically, um, both you you could use both terms. Uh, it does actually occur as Elohim, I think, in most of the time, if not all the time, in the Old Testament. Um, but both are valid, you know? Um, so let me lower your hand. Okay, so yeah, so only context will tell you when it's a construct state. However, what happens, interestingly enough, is when it's plural, normally the plural would be banim el. So that would be Sons God, which interestingly, let, let's do uh, Elohim. So sons God or sons Elohim. So is it saying divine sons? Or is it saying sons of God? Well, if you're saying sons of God, you actually have to remove the mem. You get rid of the mem the mem, the letter M. And instead it's Bani Elohim. So now it, it, it's a co combined thing. So now it's sons, arrow, Elohim. So if you ever see it with a mem, then you know it's not a, it, then you know it's not a construction. You know that it's a adjective. So the second word is the adjective in this case, if, if it's spelled with a mem. But like I said, in the singular, it doesn't distinguish between construct state and regular. So that means you have to judge by context. But when it's plural for the masculine, then you know if it has the mem, then the second noun right after it is the adjective. But if it doesn't have the mem, then you know for a fact that it has to be construct which again, construct just means two nouns combined to form a phrase. Uh, and that phrase specifically is first noun of the second noun. So, bani Elohim. Now, for feminine, it works the opposite in 
singular, the form changes. In plural, it doesn't. So uh, I'm going to use Malacca because um, the form for daughter is complicated, more complicated than some of the other ones. So Malacca Elohim. That would that would necessarily. The reason I'm changing that is because usually, usually an adjective has to agree with the, the person. It's called a person, I, I believe, or maybe it's a number. Uh, basically, if it's a singular noun, the adjective has to be singular, usually. If it's a plural noun, the adjective has to be plural, usually. Um, I say usually because, you know, sometimes with language, there's always some obscure exceptions that happen. So I don't want to see, say absolutely always, but the majority of the time, adjectives need to agree with whether it's singular or plural. So, Malacca L, you know for a fact this means divine daughter because it doesn't have a different ending. But if it has a Tav ending, then it's daughter of God. Uh, I'm sorry, daughter. I, I said daughter, but that's the wrong word. So it's queen, right? So Malacca is queen. Div uh, so divine queen. Um, and then, but Malakat or Melka is queen of God. Queen of L. Plural, it's the same. It's always the same. So, so uh, you have to judge by context. Just like the singular of the masculine, you have to judge by context. So it would be either divine queens or queens of Emily. So that's basically how that construct thing works. Now, what's interesting is, so you see right here in, when it's in construct, it changes from a hey or an E letter at the end to a, a T letter or a Tav. But in original Hebrew, it always was a Tav. It was never a hey. It only became hey uh, later on due to uh, relaxing of the sounds. So um, let me see if I have a, I'm gonna look, at, look this up just quickly. Um, let's see which Semitic languages have this. Um, I think what I can do is um, Okay. All right, so I'm going to share this with you guys. Um So these are different Semitic languages. So in Akkadian, it's Bintum. Arabic, it's with, with a, a Tav. 
But look, it has a second, it has a second one. It also has Ibna, so it has the A ah ending, just like Hebrew. Um, but Hebrew has Bath or Bat or Bit, but the plural has Benot. Now, remember, I think it was, uh, was it two weeks ago or last week? I don't know, but uh, I've talked about roots. Remember, words have roots. And in, in the root of son is, and daughter is ban or bana, which means to build. And so because that's the root word, that means the original feminine for, for daughter had to have noon in it, the letter N. But in Hebrew, it doesn't. The, the noon disappears. And the reason for that is because of a very common phenomenon in Semitic languages, which basically the noon drops out when it's followed by a consonant um, in the pronunciation of the syllable. So this happens for many words. And this also occurs in Akkadian and other Semitic languages where the noon just drops out in many words. And so, um, but in the same way, the same thing happened with the feminine ending for Hebrew. The feminine, feminine ending was originally a tav. But because of the way it was being pronounced, it became it, the sound. It sounded like the T was almost silent. And so it would be like Benath or Benith. And because the final if the th sound or the T sound, it was so soft that it sounded like it was silent. So instead it was, it, it became pronounced as Benath or bene, because like I said, the TH and the T became silent and dropped. So ever since then, the feminine in Hebrew has always been hey, but fragments or remnants of the original feminine are preserved in the construct state uh, of Hebrew. So that's pretty cool that, that Hebrew preserves evidence of that original form. And um, another thing is that when you add endings, like uh, suffixes for possessives, that also gives, uh, makes it into a construct state. So for example, when you pull up the document file again, So if you were to say, let's see here, um, I guess we'll go with, with sun again. Um, bani, um, let's see, maybe I think of a better one. All right, I'll do king. Okay, so malak. And if you're doing malaki, that would mean, depending on context, because it can mean different things, but that word malaki means my king. It can, in, in the example I'm giving, it means my king. So the yod conveys the, the, uh, the my meaning, okay? But, if, um, if you're doing our king, you do Melakanu or I'm not sure if it's Melakanu or Melaknu, but however many syllables it has, it's, it's probably Melaknu. And so the ending nu means our or us. 
So what you're actually saying here, it's actually a construct state. What you're saying is king of us. That's what you're actually saying. So it's actually forming a construct state. Um, King us, king of us. This is also preserved uh, in the plural more clearly. Because remember I said the plural drops the mem? Well, guess what happens when you make it plural? It becomes kings of us or our kings. You know, if you're translating it in regular English, you'll say our kings. But a literal meaning would be kings of us, and it's a construct state. And that's why the mem drops. And what's really interesting is that Akkadian preserves the same phenomenon of when it's in a construct state, even though it has a genitive case, uh, the, the, uh, Even when it's in the construct state, the cases drop in Akkadian for the first word, just like we what we see in uh, Hebrew. So that's a very cool connection between Akkadian and Hebrew. It has the same rules of construct state. So uh, with that said, I'm going to show you guys pronouns. Let me just pull it up. Oh, actually, so let me let me also now show you guys um, about the letter or the concept of definite article. So definite article basically just means the, okay? But in original Hebrew, the did not exist. The completely did not exist. It, in all languages, the did not exist originally. The only comes to existence after time to help facilitate meaning. But like I said, originally it just did not exist. And so the way we say the in Hebrew is a hey at the beginning. It's called a prefix. So if you say the king, you're going to add a hey at the beginning. Now, what's interesting is Aramaic does the same thing, but instead it has aleph at the end, a suffix. And that means the king. But instead it'd be king the, king the. So the king in Hebrew, but king the in Aramaic. All right. And interestingly, so you have, if you're saying the kings, plural, you'd have Emelakim. But if you have in Aramaic, and Aramaic is basically a dialect of Hebrew, that's how close it is. That's why I'm mentioning Aramaic briefly here. So Melakha means the king, but plural, you don't have, it's not melakima, it's melakia. It becomes construct state, weirdly enough. So it becomes kings uh, of the. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so originally Hebrew didn't even have the. So it kind of is funny when you look at the, like when you look at variants in the Dead Sea Scrolls or Samaritan, and you see some manuscripts have the, some don't. Same thing with Greek uh, Septuagint. It actually, once you realize that the originally didn't exist, then perhaps some of these differences of the might be inserted by scribes, and they wasn't that meaning of distinction wasn't originally there. But in the process of time, the was added, and it's, it's distinctions was made, were made between uh, different forms so that it would be definite article 
in some manuscripts and indefinite or no definite article in other manuscripts. Uh, another interesting phenomenon, which I believe only occurs in Hebrew, at least when I say only in Hebrew, I mean, I don't think it occurs in Akkadian. So when you're doing a direct object, but it has to be definite object. So direct definite object in Hebrew, you use Aleph Tav. Have, has anyone heard of Aleph Tav? I'm sure you guys have. Anyone want to say what they think Aleph Tav means? I want to give someone a chance to see if anyone has anything to say on Aleph Tav. If they've, if they've mentioned, if they've heard it. Uh, like, have you guys heard people talk about Aleph Tav and, and what it means? What'd you say? It's called Aleph Tav, a, the et. Have you heard people talk about this? Yes. So what do you think it means? Have you, have, what, what do they say it means? The Aleph and the Tav, I thought that was the beginning and the end. And, and, and what does that mean, the beginning and the end? What does what mean? Uh, the so Alpha and Omega? The what? So, so basically, a lot of people like you, you. You hear of the there's a there's a translation of the Bible, translation of the Bible because I'm not sure they actually translated it much, but uh, it's called a translation and it's called the Et Sefer. Have you guys heard of that Et Sefer? And no. basically, basically, it's like a messianic translation. Um, and there's many there's many people who believe Aleph Tav is falsely not translated. Uh, because in Hebrew, you're, you look at the experts and the, and the experts say Aleph Tav can't be translated because it's a grammatical mark. Um, so most people are under the impression when they know that, when they hear this, that, oh, they're not translating a word. That's not right. They need to translate it. They actually are basically translating it. It's just, it's being translated by grammatical form. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you have like, uh, like in Hebrew, uh, there's a question, like you can have a question mark. Uh, I mean, excuse me, you, you can have a, a, a letter or a word to convey that you're asking a question. So, but we don't really translate that often. Usually what we translate it as is a question mark. That's not really a translation. In Hebrew, taking the Aleph Tav, we basically translate it by, per, by putting it in the proper grammar form. So Aleph Tav, like a lot of people believe Aleph Tav is like a special meaning prophecy of the Messiah. There may be some small messianic connotations there, but the prime, that's not the primary meaning of it. The primary meaning of Aleph Tav is a direct object marker. And what that means is, let's say you want, let's say you want to say, um, you want to say, obey the king. Uh, let's see. No, so, okay, so it was, the question was asked, is it like when Yahweh told Moses, I am, has sent you to set my people free in Exodus? So basically, if you're saying obey the king, you'd have, well, I'm not sure if obey is the correct translation here. So I'll just say serve the king, okay? So serve the king. So you would have a bed, serve, emalech, okay. So, um, so serve the king, but guess what? 
because there's no Aleph Tav there, grammatically, it would mean something on the line of uh, royal serve, royal servant or something like that. Basically, I mean like royal servant or servant of royalty, basically, okay? But that's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say serve the king, as in obey the king, follow the king. So how do we say that? How do we convey that in Hebrew? We have to add the Aleph Tav. So that the Aleph Tav means serve. Who do we serve? Or who do we serve? Oh, okay. Aleph Tav points points us to the king. Serve who? Who are we serving? Oh, the king. Okay. Al-Tab tells us who we serve. So God created the heavens and the earth. So in Hebrew, that is, in Hebrew, that's, Bereshit. Watch your language, everybody, when you say this word, Bereshit. Um, bara. Usually in Hebrew, verbs come first, followed by subject, but not always. In English, usually the subject comes first, first and then the verb. So God comes first, subject created is the verb, that's English. But in Hebrew, it's created God, the heavens and the earth. Okay, but so Elohim, I have to type backwards because this is, uh, even though it's the font is Hebrew, my computer is set up to type in English. So I had to type left to right. Um, Oops. All right. All right. So, um, so in the beginning, oops, I misspelled that word. Oops. Oh, no. Oh. Um, All right, so in the beginning, in, what's interesting, what's kind of funny is that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you actually could see that and it wouldn't be considered inaccurate because sometimes that does happen, the rest of But the correct way to spell it is Paris. Then Bara created God, he's the subject, at the heavens, Es Shamim. And, and this little letter right here means and. Okay. Whenever you see this letter at the beginning of a word, that almost always means and. That's, this is a wa. So always be on the lookout for this word. And that usually means and. Likewise, whenever you see hey at the beginning of a word, usually it means hey. Uh, excuse me. Usually it means the. But not always. It has many other meanings as well. So you can't, that's not as, that's not as certain, but why pretty much always is and. Hey can mean a question in the beginning. It can also mean a, a special verb form called, called a causative. It can also mean a vocative, which means like, like if you were saying, oh, king, you are great. Oh, king, you are great. Oh, again, you say, hey. Uh, but yeah, so it's a little more complicated with hey, but wa is always and at the beginning. So at 
the heavens and at the earth. So basically what this is telling us is God created, okay, God created the heavens and the earth. So what is this, what does this colon mean? This colon, colon equals the verb. Colon equals the verb. So pretend you get rid of this verb, okay? So that now we know that this colon is a substitute for the verb. So God created the heavens and he created the earth. So that's why you're also going to see, and you're going to see in Hebrew sometimes where there'll be multiple, multiple nouns that are being talked to. So let me show you guys one example. I'm going to open the Blue Letter Bible and I'll show you guys this. Um, all right. Now, this is in. Genesis chapter one and what I'm going to be showing you guys is the verse 29 and 30. Yeah, blue letter Bible is great. So Now we'll zoom in. Okay. Huh. I, I would like this to be. Uh... Whoops, what happened? It went to Revelation. We don't want to go to Revelation just yet. All right, I guess I'll just have to do it at this point. All right, so hopefully that's big enough for you guys to see. Get rid of the Facebook there. All right, so. Um, so we have, this is the, the, the verse that says, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein is life. Look at this. this is, these are in italics. That means they added this. I have given. And so I, that should not be there. So instead it should say, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein is life every green herb for meat, and it was so. Meat means food in older English, okay? So let me, um, I'm gonna post the Hebrew in the document, and then we will go, I will go through with you guys to show you the Aleph Tav thing and how it works when there's, when there are many Aleph Tavs in a row, because that makes it much more complicated. When there's a bunch of out tops. Whoops. Uh, what the heck? This is not good. Maybe if I do it smaller font. All right, that's better. Smaller font worked. I tried to do it in like 36 font and it, it made it too close together. So that wasn't readable. But uh, 20 font works pretty good. All right. Um, what the? That's not right. Uh, 
weird. Um, hold on one second. All right. It's form formatting very weird on my on my screen, but uh, so I will start sharing again the screen. All right, so, and, and he said, and he, God, said, behold, I give to you at all the, or every herb, seeding seed or bearing seed which is upon and by the way is does not occur in hebrew you know in english we say he is nice in hebrew you'd say he nice because is is not necessary the only time you say is means exist when you're trying to say the verb exist he exists then you say he is He is merely existing. Then you would say he is, but uh, you don't say is to make word like phrases. Um, like she is sweet. You just say she's sweet. Or you might not even say that. You might say like, uh, I don't know. But anyways, so. Uh, which is upon the faces of all the earth and at all the, or and at every one of the trees. That's a singular. So, and at each tree which is which has in it fruit of a tree seeding seed or bearing seed for you it shall be to eat and for all life of, or for every beast or every creature, basically, every living thing of the earth and, oh yeah, that, so that's beast. Uh, so every beast of the earth and for every bird of the skies or the heavens and for every creeper upon the earth, which is in it, which has in it the life or so, no, the soul of life at every, I forget what that word is, Yorah, Oseb, to eat. And it was so. Um, so hold on. <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that one, Steve. <laughs> yeah, so all creatures have souls, exactly. Animals have souls, according to Hebrew. But uh, green herb, that's what it means. Yarach means green. That's why I couldn't remember. All right, so now let's see what Aleph Tov means. And God said, behold, I give. There's the verb. This is the verb. 
So that means Aleph Tav, every time you see Aleph Tav, that is the verb. And God said, behold, I give to you colon, every herb sowing seed, which is, oh, I need to make this smaller. Every seed which is sowing, wait, every herb sowing seed which is upon the bases. Oh, Melissa accidentally came off. It is upon the bases of all the earth. Hopefully, she comes back on. And wait a minute. All right. There's the colon and at every tree. It has the there, but the is awkward. Every the tree or all the tree doesn't really make sense in English. So every tree which has in it fruit of uh, in it tree fruit sowing seed um, to you it shall be for food okay so the, so that's it that's the end that, that's the end of it, all right? So that means, behold, I give to you. So now we get rid of this. Behold to you, the colon, I give. And so when God said, behold to you, I give every herb sowing seed, which is upon the faces of all the earth. and I give every tree which has in it tree fruit sowing seed. To you, it shall be for food. That's the verb. That's now the new verb. So be is the new verb for the, ne the next series of Aleph Tab, okay? So to you, it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens and to every creeper upon the earth which has in it a living soul at every green uh herb for food and it was so so let's see how this works to you it shall be for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to every creeper upon the earth which has in that living soul it shall be every green let's see Maybe, it actually, it might, it might still actually be, um, it's possible it actually goes back to I give. So then, and to every creeper upon the earth which has in it a living soul, I give, because it has the colon here. So it, it might go back all the way to that first verb, right? And God said, behold to you, I give every herb sowing seed which is upon the faces of all the earth, and I give every tree which has in it fruit, tree fruit sowing seed, to you which shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to every creeper upon the earth which has in it a living soul. I, right, 
to you it shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to every cube upon the earth which has in it a living soul, I give every green herb for food. And it was so. So you see how that works. The Aleph Tav is a substitute for the verb in that sentence or clause area, or the, the, the section. And so in a passage which says that David committed adultery with Bathsheba, Aleph Tav, David uh, commits adultery with her. And then he kills Uriah. He has Uriah killed. It's at him. So uh, that's how the Aleph Tav works. I know that was a lot of complicated stuff there. Um, let me just, I'm just going to send Melissa a message to see if she's, uh, if she's not coming back. But, um, so let's see what our time is. We, I did start later. So wait, oh yeah, Melissa is on. So who, who got off? Oh, it was, um, I, I know now. My bad. It was, uh, I believe it was Jesse who got off. It might be late for him or something. I don't know. But anyways, um, with that said, now I want to, I want to talk to you guys about pronouns and so I have I have that link open let me just pull it up for you guys okay Here we go. So in Hebrew, as well as ancient Hebrew, like in Akkadian, um, we have the original is Anki or Enachi. That means I. But later on, even in biblical Hebrew, Enachi gets replaced with Ani. So if you want to say I, like, like, okay, so most of the time verbs have an I in the verb. So you don't need to say I, but the subject I is used and in, in, in an initial reference. So if you're saying initially I, then you would use the, the pronoun. Um, and you want, if you want to emphasize that you are the one saying it, you say I. So, and, and key used to be originally the pronoun you used for I, but it became ani. Similarly, you have enachnu, and then it eventually became anu. And you have ata, at, and so masculine is ata, feminine is at. Plural is atem for masculine, feminine achen. And then third person is hua or hu, and feminine is hia or he. And the so this is uh, he and this is she. You ever hear the, the, the funny joke uh, in Hebrew? They say something like that. They say, they say, who is he? And then, the, and then, and then they say, she is he. And, and then the whole joke is that, what, what are you talking about? 
it's kind of like who's who's on first you know the whole baseball joke thing uh and so for plural you have hem for masculine and hen for plural or feminine and uh but when you go to the when you go to the wiktionary or the dictionary the hebrew remember i told you guys earlier that the noon gets dropped often in pronunciation well that happened with the pronouns originally there was a noon part of the pronoun so originally it was with a noon and so you have in arabic it's anta aramaic it's ant uh, in ethiopian or an ethiopian it's anta but uh, in hebrew it's ata and in Akkadian, interestingly enough, Akkadian also agrees with Hebrew and it's Ata. But original Hebrew agrees with Arabic, Aramaic, and Ethiopian in Anta. Okay, and uh, then we have. Um, And T. Again, Akkadian is Ati, but Arabic and T. Ethiopian and T. Get ease is Ethiopian. Um, Aramaic is Anti and Ant. And then we have, let's see what we got here. Um, so we go to Anahu. And we have Kirin Anahu. Arabic. Oh, uh, Arabic. Remember I, remember I told you guys that it becomes Ani. Well, Arabic has Ani. Aramaic, Ani or Ana. And Ethiopian has Ana. But a Hebrew and Akkadian are the only ones that preserve the original Anahu. Or Anah. And you can see it says right here a reduced form appears to have coexisted with Anna. So maybe in the original Hebrew, both were used, potentially. Um, and then we have, Atem, you go, you go to the here, it's Antem. So Kidian. Uh, Agree, like agrees with Hebrew with, with dropping the noon. But Arabic, once again, Arabic has it, Aramaic has it, and Ye'ez has the noon. Same thing for Atan. You go, you go to the Proto Semitic, basically, is the original Hebrew of what scholars think the original Hebrew is. Atina for Akkadian, but again, Arabic originally had a noon, Aramaic, and Ethiopian. And then we have, let's see this one. So Akkadian just has Ninu. It has it doesn't have the Aleph at the beginning. Arabic agrees without the Aleph at the beginning. Aramaic agrees with Hebrew. It has Anachna. So Hebrew, Anachnu, 
but Ge'ez, uh, Ge'ez has similarly without the Aleph. Um, but what about Anu? What is that? So Anu is not really, doesn't really appear in any of the other languages, uh, related languages. Now you go to, you go to Hua and it actually is with the, with the S. Akkadian has Su, Arabic agrees with Hebrew, and so does Aramaic. Um, and then Sia instead of Hia. So again, that's with Akkadian, but Arabic and Aramaic agree with Hebrew. Um, I'm not seeing the uh, etymology thing for this one. Yeah, I'm not seeing it for now. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty interesting. So now let me show you guys. Uh, there's something else to show you guys about this. Coming back here, this is a scholarly thing. This, this talks about Indo-European languages, but the same phenomenon in Indo-European languages occurs in Hebrew with Akkadian, shockingly, which gives evidence for this being an actual thing. So you take a look here and says, centum and satum languages. What it basically says, it says, Centum languages, they typically began with a K sound, but in Satum languages, they often began with an S. So you take a look and you, and you, and you look at ones to give an example. Um, uh, I would like to see actual examples. I thought they gave examples. Hold on. Let me see if I have uh, some examples for you guys to convey this. Um, One sec, because this is pretty interesting. All right, so here we go. Let's try this again. So we take a look here, the word for hundred, okay? So you go to the top to see what this is talking about. Now, these are Indo-European languages, okay? So English, Gothic, Latin, Ancient Greek, Sanskrit, Iranian, Slavic. Whoops, I don't want this like that. Okay. Um, 
Baltic, Celtic, Armenian, Albanian, Tukharian, Hittite. So we look, we go down to the word for hundred, and we got hund with the H. Centum with a C or a K. Centum. So hund, hund, and kend. Okay. But then you have, oh, yeah, in Greek, this is katam. So it's ka. But here we have. Uh, Okay, so then we have Sanskrit satam with an S, Avestin satam. This is Church Slavonic, Sutto. Um, and yeah. So. So as you can see, there's a very interesting phenomenon of some languages have the same word as H starting with the H and others have it starting with the S. The same exact thing has happened between Akkadian and Hebrew, where it has the H versus the S. Let me see, are there any other examples here? I'm not sure of any at the moment. All right, here it looks like we got one. Mm, no, never mind. Anyway, so that is that. I don't think that's coincidence. I think it's a similar language phenomenon between multiple different languages of different language families. And so that is why originally in Hebrew, the original Hebrew seems to be the what the Akkadian is, the S rather than an H. But so our Hebrew has the H uh, rather than the S. So when you're trying to learn the Bible or study the Bible, you'll keep in mind that it evolved into an H sound. So I'll pull up. I'll pull up that uh, screen again for you guys so you can see the pronouns again. Oh yeah, so see the bottom, hua and hia. But like I said, when you go to the thing, it becomes an S and scholars believe S is the original. And you know why? What's really interesting, what's really interesting is that Hebrew is not the only language that has these pronouns. Guess what else has these same pronouns? I'm gonna show you guys, this is, this is very cool. Um, Strangely, somehow, Egyptian has the same exact pronouns, ancient Egyptian language. Isn't that amazing? So let me show you guys. This is shocking. Because it's not going to show me on the page. All right, um, let me see here. Let me see if it says it on. Uh, Um, 
All right, here we go. There we got it. So here we go, Egyptian language. So it has multiple types of pronouns. It has the suffix and dependent and independent. Now, independent basically means it's its own word, and that's what we're talking about. So remember, en enach or anahu. Here we have. Um, hold on one sec. Let me let me pull up that other tab for you guys. All right, so we have um, whoops. All right, so you guys can see this, right? So I'm switching between sections. So enachi and enach. We have enachnu and nachach. And then remember it's anta. Oops. Uh, Egyptian, uh, enta or nitak. Um, wait, I'm sorry, this was a second singular masculine so that would be this one so it has a k there in that um which is not in uh, the hebrew one but uh there are some hebrew uh suffixes of pronouns which have the k So it doesn't look as exact as I remembered it before. Um, if, if they have it rendered correctly here on, on this uh, Wikipedia article, I'm not sure if it's rendered correctly, but um, when I, when I uh, maybe it's, is it Coptic? Coptic is the, is the younger form, the younger form of Egyptian. So you have Anna. Anna. And then basically Natan, which would be like Anatan. Um, there's definitely some similarities. So scholars believe that scholars actually group Egyptian and Hebrew, like Semitic languages, as if they're both from a common ancestor. I'm not sure that's actually true, but there are some sim interesting similarities between the two languages. It could be from all the times they were interacting with each other in ancient times, you know, because just like English, English copied stuff from different languages all the time. So certainly 
ancient Egyptian and could have done the same thing. Um, so it's 1030 right now. We did start a little bit later, so we're going to go on a little bit more, but uh, not too much longer. So let me see what else I have for you guys. Ah, yes, I have a paradigm. Um, all right, let's share this. It also could be the case of, um, like, for example, Akkadian borrows the alphabet or their, their letters from Sumerian. And because of that, they borrowed some Sumerian words in some, uh, like, potentially some grammar stuff they, they, they might have borrowed from Sumerian. I believe something similar happened between Hebrew and other languages as well. Um, so that said, sharing the screen. So in Jesenius's grammar, we have the pronouns. So, so we have an, anaki, right? But at the end of a noun, you have a yod. If it's a verb, like it, let's say he loves me or he loved me, you would say, Ahav, which means love, or he loved. And then me, you'd add at the end of the verb, ahav ni. Ni gets uh, suffixed at the end of a verb to, to convey that it's the verb is being done to me, to the, the object is me. If you're saying you did a, a verb to you or the, you would use, you, you would uh, put at the end of the word a, a kaf or a k letter in Hebrew. Um, if it's plural, no, if it's, uh, if it's singular and, you're, and it's a noun, you say thy uh, with, with just a kaf and thy for plural would be ich, yod, ka. So let, let me, uh, I'm gonna type the, these things for you guys because it kind it's kind of hard to explain using that without, without having access to the, the document file. But if I actually have access to the document file, then it makes it easier to explain All right. All right, so can you guys only see? Yeah, you guys can only see my document file. That's good. All right. So, with that said, we have, let's say we'll use the king example again, okay? So, Melaki means my king or my kings, depending on context. But Malach, Malach, I don't know how you'd say that because there's two coughs in a row. That's actually confusing. 
So let's not use that. Let's use um, let's use son. Okay. So Vani is my son, and it's also my sons, depending on the context. But Benach or Bencha means your son or thy son. But if you add the Yod, it becomes your sons or thy sons. Um, and then Let's see here. And his son would be Banu. His sons would be Baniu because the mem drops. Again, it's a construct, remember? It's a the first, the first noun is Ben or Beni. And the second noun is him or his. So it combines sons of him. Um, then you have Banah. In original Hebrew, it was Banah with a T, but again, Hebrew has uh, hey. Then in plural, it's her sons. So, oops. Uh, so her son, Bana, her sons, Bania. Then we've got Bahnu, which is our son, and Baninu, which is our sons. And you when we have Banachem or Bancham, which is your son, your as in a group of people, multiple people, your son. So not singular you, but plural you. Your son, and then adding the yod, banicha. Your sons. So if you're talking to parents, two people together, their parents of one son. So my mom and dad, if you're talking to my mom and dad, you would say, talking about me, your son, Onia, or Andrew. So, Benchem, or Benachem. And, and, I, and I don't know the best pronunciations necessarily for some of these words. So, uh, forgive me if my pronunciation is off sometimes. But um, I'm learning as you guys are at the same time. I, I've studied a lot of the grammar rules, but in terms of like becoming fluent, I'm learning that. And part of fluency is pronunciation and vocabulary and things like that. So I'm still learning like you guys. But so, uh, so if you're talking to my parents and talking about me, you'd say Ben Khan. But if you're talking about me and my siblings, you'd say Ben Ni Khan. And then likewise, you have You have Benam, which means their son. You can also have sometimes Benen, their son. But then in, in a plural, it's Beniem. And there's also for that, that's for masculine, they. So uh, their son. Their 
their sons. And, and same thing with uh, feminine. Uh, whoops. Their feminine son versus their son's feminine. Okay. And then it's pretty much it for that. Um, I will show you guys, let's see. All right, so now, I want to show you guys. Oops. So that that was uh, the suffixes, right? So let me go to Akkadian for you guys, and I want to show you guys how it's the same uh, basic thing. Very similar, but it's more complex. So that's uh... all right. So what we got here, we have the whoops. Um... All right. So we had these ones, right? Anahu, anta, anti, su, si, ninu, atenu, atina, sunu, and sina, all right? But we also have something called oblique, which is the object. object. So, um, so that would be these, oops, this is these middle column right here. And then dative, that is, uh, oh yeah, oblique, I think uh, utilizes, um, is both genitive and direct object, whereas dative is indirect object. But then we have, the suffixed pronouns, which is what I was showing you guys just a minute ago, where you have E, which means my, and then the, the, the ka at the end, right? Same thing as in Hebrew. So, um, so let's see here. Um, let me just go back to the other thing here. Like, so this is just sending us this PDF file. And so you look and you have, there's the ka, right? Here's the ka. And then and it has the the who and the he remember it has an H versus the S. Well Akkadian does the S, right? And then the Plural is um, the plural nu. Katie has me. Then 
kam, but a kirin has kun. And then, and it distinguishes, a kirin distinguishes between feminine and masculine. So kuna and kina. And so um, Hebrew has kam and kin and kam. But in Akkadian, it's both, it's noon for both, kuna and kin. And then Hebrew has hem and hen. Akkadian has the S instead. And again, it's N instead of an M. So it's, they're both M. Whereas in Hebrew, masculine is M, feminine is N, but in Akkadian, it's both noon. So I am inclined to think the way Hebrew distinguishes may be more original than the Akkadian with, with masculine as mem and feminine as noon. But I show you guys the Akkadian just to show you how close it is. It's, it's almost identical, right? So clearly they're related to the same basic language, the same basic root language. Um, and I have one final thing to share with you guys, and it's a bit, it might be a bit uh, overwhelming, but it's not, I understand that this is just being shared with you guys. So uh, it's not like you, I'm expecting you guys to become like, oh yeah, I know that by heart, you know what I mean? But I'm just introducing the concept and then we can kind of learn it more as we go. So with that said, this is going now to a list of the verb conjugations. And we're only going to go through the main ones. We're not going to go through some of the other obscure ones. Okay. Um, so here we go. We're only focusing on the first one, the ha'al, and it's the simple active. So we've got here, uh, they, they use katsar, which means to cut something. So katsar t. T means I, but the T ending, that's a suffix, means I. Now, just so you guys know, Hebrew has two tenses, perfect and imperfect. Perfect basically means that it's finished, it's complete. Imperfect means un unfinished, in uh, incomplete. But it can occur in past, present, or future. Both of them can. So if it's perfect, it can be perfect past, perfect present, or perfect future. And same thing with imperfect. It can be imperfect past, present, or future. So this is perfect, what we're going through right now. And that's uh, Kitsar T, I cut. Kitsar nu, we cut. Kit uh, and then that, that it's, it's the same thing for, for in first person, masculine and feminine, it's the same. There's no distinction between masculine and feminine. So the verb is cut, katsar, but the endings differentiate between who is doing the cutting. With a T at the end, tav yod, that's I, nun wa, that's we. So cut I. Cut we, cut sar t again. Cut i, cut we. Okay, so now uh, second person you cut sar ta. Cut you or you cut. Cut sar tom, you cut you as in plural more than one you. Cut sar t, you cut feminine. Cut sar tan. You cut more than one year. No ending. So when there's no ending, 
Context will tell you if it's a noun or a verb, because when there's no ending, it could be a masculine noun or a feminine, uh, excuse me, or a uh, verb. The reason I said feminine by mistake is I was thinking ahead to something else. Um, so ketsaru, they cut. They cut is the same in feminine as in masculine. Ketsara is uh, cut she or she cut. And then uh, now it's prefixes most of the time instead of suffixes. Suffixes is at the end of, an, of a word, prefix is at the beginning of a word. So now we've got prefixes to signify imperfect. And that's exor or exar, I will cut. Next or we will cut, and it's not really will, it's more like am cutting or is or had had been cutting, like you know, like because it can be past, present, or future. So it's more like ing, like cutting to convey that it's ongoing, it's not a completed action, it's incomplete. Uh, so the aleph at the beginning is I. Noon is we, then tav at the beginning is you will cut, singular you, masculine. If it's a feminine, it's uh, tiksari, so it's tav at the beginning and yod at the end. Plural for masculine is tav at the beginning with wa at the end. And then feminine plural, tav at the beginning and noon he at the end. Then you've got third person. He will cut is with a yod at the beginning. Um, and then they will cut yod at the beginning, wa at the end. Similar to second person uh, with, but it, instead of for second person, it's, it's a uh, tav instead of a yod. But for third person, it's yod. Or plural. Um, then you have feminine singular tav, and then for plural, it's tav prefix and nun he suffix. Now notice there's some there's some uh, identical ones here for second person masculine singular for. So that's you will cut. It has a tav at the beginning and nothing at the end. Same thing with feminine, uh, the feminine were, uh, verb, which is third person, singular, she will cut. So when you see a verb with tav at the beginning and nothing at the end, that could mean Either you will cut or she will cut. Um, so context is what determines it. But that's very confusing. Why would the why would the verb mean sometimes you and sometimes she? Well, what's interesting is we look at Akkadian, and, and Akkadian has these basic same verb forms. So what we're gonna look here is. So Akkadian does that a little differently. Apparently Akkadian does not have imperfect. I'm not sure why that is, or maybe scholars are just defining it differently. But look at their preterite. Preterite means past tense. Their past tense is identical to Hebrew, um, nearly identical to uh, the imperfect. So Aleph at the beginning, Right, so let's let's compare. Whoops, uh, wrong. Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. All right. So so at now so the PRS 
The PRS is, is the verb that they're using, which is identical to the Ketsar thing, basically. So it's basically just like a symbolic word used to mean the verb in question, whatever verb is being used. So in this case, in this PDF, it uses Ketsar for Hebrew, but in this one, it uses PRS. So Aleph is, or A is added at the beginning, just like in Hebrew. And that means I. Ni is added at the beginning. Well, look at that. Ni is added at the beginning for Hebrew. It means the same thing, we. And then for second person masculine, Tav is added at the beginning. Well, look, same thing. And it means you will or you. Not, not you will. It means you did, because as I said, it's in the past in Akkadian. But it's the same form. Ta plus the plus the, the verb. No ending. Then we've got feminine. Ta at the beginning and e at the end. Well, look what we got here. Ta at the beginning, yod at the end. Same thing for Akkadian. Then we have for the plural. Now look, the plural is the same for masculine and feminine but not for Hebrew. So the masculine is identical. Tav at the beginning and wa at the end. But where it differs is in the feminine. The feminine distinguishes and makes a noon hay. Um, but Hebrew doesn't make that distinction. And interestingly, remember how I said it's the same as uh, the third person, like noon hay as well. So unlikely that they both had that form. So it must have came to happen over time. So originally, Akkadian preserves the correct form. It was just, it was just a uh, wa at the end for both masculine and feminine. And then look, third person is the same for masculine and feminine. So we look here, it's yod at the beginning for masculine, but feminine, it's a tav. Remember I said tav, why would it be both? Why would it be both you and she? That would be, that would be confusing. Well, originally there wasn't that confusing identical spelling because originally yod was used, not tav. And yod meant either he or she. But because it was confusing to people, speakers of Hebrew didn't know if they were talking about he or she, sometimes they decided to add ta, change this to tav instead of yod. But Akkadian preserves evidence of the original form. And then look, we have for masculine plural, yod at the beginning with a wa at the end. And same thing for feminine, yod at the beginning, wa at the end. And we've got Yod at the beginning, wa at the end. But for feminine, again, it has the tav and the nun he, which differs from the Akkadian. But it's, it's so close that it is definitely related to each other, clearly from the same thing. Okay. And then, um, and finally, there's a form called. The where is it? The stative. No, is that what it is? Hold on. So we will not be doing the uh, practice exercise like we did the first two ones because we're already we've already been doing this for too long. So I would encourage you guys to practice your, your pronunciation on your own time. And then next time, hopefully, we will do the practice pronunci uh, pronunciation together. Um, so let me just find it.
Um, where is it? Hmm. Um, okay, so I think, I think this is it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that is. It. All right. So let me pull that back up. So share the screen with you guys. All right. So notice um, the perfect in Hebrew, it's called a stative. Uh, excuse me, in Akkadian, it's called a stative. In Hebrew, it's a perfect. But Akkadian has perfect for something else. Akkadian's perfect is uh, with a tav put in the middle of the of the preterite, which corresponds with the Hebrew imperfect. So that's very different for perfect. But uh, the stative corresponds with the Hebrew perfect tense. So the only the, the primary difference here is the first person. So um, we have in the first person T, right? Tav Yod. We don't have that in Akkadian. But we do have uh, new for we, and likewise, we have that. Anu for we for Akkadian. Then we've got T for the fat for oops, I'm sorry. Ta for masculine. And there he is, ta. And we've got T for feminine U. Perfect. And T for uh, feminine stative U in the Cadia. And then just like earlier, there was, there was the M in the noon versus the noon in the noon for the masculine and feminine. Whereas for, for Hebrew, it was M for masculine and, uh, and N for feminine. In uh, Akkadian, it's noon for both, right? Well, the same thing here. But it clearly corresponds. But so we've got Tom and Tan again, and that corresponds right here. And then no ending, right? No ending. Well, look at here, no ending for, for third person masculine, uh, which means he. And then she. Remember I said it was hey, but it's hey in Hebrew, but originally it was tav. Well, again, Akkadian, it has tav. And then we've got wa for, for they, for masculine, and same thing for feminine. The masculine and feminine are, are identical. And then, you know how I said there's evidence that a, a dialect similar to Akkadian is the source of Hebrew? Well, look at this. Um, remember how I said that in the imperfect of Hebrew, the similarity between um, the identical spelling of she will cut versus you will cut, it doesn't make sense. Why would it be the same spelling for both? That's very confusing, right? Where does that come from? 
Akkadian doesn't have that. Akkadian has Tav for you, but it has Yod for, for she. Well, it comes from an ancient dialect that the, the, the Tav being used for both comes from an ancient dialect of Akkadian. And that is evidence that Hebrew ultimately comes from a older form of Akkadian. So basically Akkadian in, a, in one of the dialects of those ancient times is the original form of Hebrew. So if you take a look here, so Akkadian has two primary dialects and that is Babylonian and Assyrian. Babylonian was used by the Babylonians. Assyrian was used by the Assyrians, but it's the same language Akkadian, but differences like dialect differences. So you look here, and you look at it. This is a, This is a, one of the most impressive grammar books of Akkadian out there. It's by a man named John Cunegard. And one of the things that he says is that um, See here. The third person feminine singular prefix of verbs is ta rather than e as in Babylonian, except in Old Assyrian only when the subject is inanimate, in which case the prefix is e as in Babylonian. Thus, the feminine. The, the third person feminine singular and the second masculine singular have the same form. Talit, she went or you went, which means that Assyrian is the origin of this uh, identical spelling for she and you. And did you know, see this lik, talit? That actually is related to the Hebrew word the, the word for walk, okay? So, um, so like the word for walk is, you go with Noah walked with God, right? And that word is Elach. I'll pull it up for you guys, just, just so you guys see that it's the same word as, as the one in the Cadian that I just, that, that was given in the example. So see it is, halak, to go, walk, come. And so, again, that example that I gave from the Akkadian grammar book, um, we've got it right here. Talik, she went or you went. Walk means like to go, to journey somewhere. So it's the same exact word uh, as in the Hebrew. So I think this is probably a good place to stop. Um, I think maybe, maybe I'll show you guys. Uh, so you know the Katsar verb, cut means to cut, right? So I'll show you the example of the suffixes like that I was telling you guys about earlier. Okay, so so it, it was um, Ketsar, let's say, Ketsar T. Um, no, uh, let's do. So 
So this would be, so Kitsarnuk or Kitsarnuka would be, we cut you or the, we cut the, we cut you. Because so Kitsar is the verb, nu is we, and kaf is you. But if it's, uh, let's see. Um, if it's uh, imperfect, um, wait, let's see. All right, here we go. This would be he is cutting me or he will cut me. And so the could also mean or he was cutting me. And basically it's he. Oops. So he is the ode. Cut is Katsar, me is me, he cut me. So he cut me. And that's how it basically works. Uh, so I know I shared with you guys a lot of concepts today and you might, what might help you guys sometimes is to rewatch some of the stuff, some of the videos we've done. Um, but now that we've gotten to this point, I'm going to close it out, but let me give you guys an opportunity to give any feedback or if you want to ask any questions before we go. If anything I said was confusing or didn't make sense, I can try to clarify it to you now. So please uh, ask away or give some feedback, positive or negative. Let me know what you guys thought of the things I shared today. Are we almost learning two languages at the same time, Arcadian and Hebrew? <laughs> Um, no, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's a good question. You're just, just comparing the two. Yeah. So it's, it's basically through the end of this, I don't think you'd be fluent necessarily in Acadia because, uh, there's, a, there's other things about it. Like, um, you might know, you might have a good understanding of Akkadian, like the rules and stuff, um, but it, it's very, it's much harder. But, but the thing is Akkadian, in some ways, it basically is Hebrew. It's like, it's very similar, similar to Arabic, Arabic, Aramaic, Ethiopian. They're so close. It's, it's almost like you are learning that same language. Like, so for example, from Latin comes the Romance languages, right? Spanish, French, Italian. Take those three, Spanish, French, Italian. If you know one of those languages fluently, you can actually understand some words in the other language. You can understand a lot of, of Spanish and Italian if you know French and vice versa. So it goes the same way. If you, if you understand Hebrew, you will understand Akkadian much easier than someone who doesn't know Hebrew at all. And if you know Akkadian, you'll also know Hebrew much easier than someone who doesn't know uh, Akkadian at all. So, so Yeshua called his father Abba, right? So, did, mm -hmm. and he said that we can call him Abba, and Paul said that too. So, I have a question: Why didn't he ha tell us to call him something in Hebrew? Does that mean that he spoke Ar uh, I'm sorry, Aramaic, which is what I think. Um, so the terms used, the Aramaic terms used may be from an Aramaic manuscript. It doesn't necessarily mean he spoke Aramaic. He could have because Jews spoke Aramaic at that time, but they also spoke Hebrew. So we don't know for sure if Messiah actually spoke Hebrew in those passages or if he spoke Aramaic in those passages. But um, even in the Septuagint, doesn't it say Abba or no? 
No. Because the Septuagint's in Greek. I don't remember what it says in, in the Greek for father. It, it just uh, uses, uh, it translates it into pater. The Greek word pater. Which is a cognate, or it's identical with the English word father. Uh, it's just pronounced and spelled differently a little bit. It's pater. And P-A-T-E-R. Um, there is one other thing I wanted to show you guys that I just was reminded of. Uh, wait, a couple things. First of all, just so you guys know, most of the time, gender in Hebrew sticks with the, the correct forms. But sometimes uh, gender is more confusing. And so I can explain that in another uh, meeting. Sometimes feminine... Feminine words are spelled with masculine spelling, but it's still feminine and vice versa. But one of the most strange one is, well, so Ab is Hebrew, Abba is Aramaic, I think. But Aramaic and Hebrew are basically, they're, they're sister languages, they're basically the same. Um, they're different dialects. And so um, so like I said, I'm gonna show you guys one more thing because that I just thought of, which is is really cool and, and further reinforces the fact that Akkadian is the origin of Hebrew. An, an ancient version of Akkadian, not necessarily Babylonian, but a, a dialect of, of Akkadian is the source of Hebrew. And so, all right, let me share the screen. All right, so father in Hebrew is Ab, right? <laughs> well, the letter of the day is Ab, yeah, or the word of the day. Um, so, singular, Ab. Remember, to make a masculine plural, it would be Abim, you would think, right? Well, actually, it's Abot. Uh, Abot. <laughs> It takes the feminine ending for some reason. Why? This is a conundrum in scholarship. P scholars and regular people who know Hebrew basically just say, well, that's the way it is. There's no reason why. It doesn't make a sense, but that's the way it is for some reason. But there's an actual reason for it. And I will show you guys. Um, and likewise, if, if, you, if you try to say abat or abba, thinking that means mother. No, it does not mean mother. Mother is am, uh, which is a masculine word. But yeah, so am is, uh, is mother. But so we go back to ab and about versus versus um, Abim, why is there the difference, right? So let's see here. I just wanna double check what the plural of mother is in Hebrew. I'm just curious. If there's any passage that says mothers. Oh, no, uh, th this is not modern Hebrew, right? No, it's not modern okay. Hebrew. It would, be, it would be biblical Hebrew and pre-biblical Hebrew. Uh, pa paleo, paleo Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, modern Hebrew is quite different in having uh, a lot of like 
modern things from other languages like English, German, Russian. It adds a bunch of stuff. But in, in a uh, original Hebrew, it doesn't have all that stuff. Um, I'm just trying to see what the plural is of mother for a second. If it's Amim or if it's Amot. I think it's Amim. But I wanted to see. No, so the the plural is uh, amot. Oh, and uh, one other thing that is actually kind of confusing is that sometimes in Hebrew, yod at the end is for a singular, like. For example, um, like if you say father of something, um, it would be if you say father of Israel it would be Abi Israel. Very weird. Because normally Abi, if it's like that, 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 that's like a construction to mean of. Like, like, like uh, the mem drops, right? Um, so occasionally it has that. So that's a little weird. But so the um, all right. So the so the final thing is to share with you guys the the uh, Akkadian adjective. I'm not going to go in depth in it, but I'm going to show you that form is the same as a boat. So let's see what we got here. All right, so singular. So remember, it means it means king in, in Akkadian. Sar, so sarum, sarim, saram, saram, sarim, saru, sari. All right, that's that's the noun. But the adjective for singular is it doesn't use sar. I'm sorry, it uses dan, and dan means strong. So danum, danim, danam. But look at this, danutum. This is for masculine. So feminine has danatam, danatim, danatam. But look, masculine has danutum. Feminine has danotim or danotum, and then. Dano team and Dana team. So masculine and feminine both have a OT for the adjective. In Hebrew, adjectives usually like um, no abstract adjectives are usually in wa tav, the, the oat ending. So that means that the masculine oat ending comes from the adjective. Now, remember I told you that the case is dropped. So just like in the feminine, 
uh, the singular is sarat, the case dropped. So it's just tav at the end, not the mem. And likewise in the plural, it's the, uh, the a with the line on the top signifies wa, okay? So does you with the line on top. So saratum, you, you take the mem off, you drop the mem off, and that's sarot, the wa tav, the oat. For the feminine. The same thing happens for the adjective. You drop off the um and you're left with a, a wa and a tab at the end for the masculine. So what we're really seeing is that a boat does not have the feminine ending. It has the masculine adjective ending from the Akkadian. It's an archaic adjective and it means fatherhood. So when you when you have one father, it's father. But when you have a bunch of fathers, you're saying the fatherhood. So it's kind of like the brotherhood. You know, like if there's many brothers, the brotherhood. It's like a group. The brotherhood greets you. Uh, your ancestors, the fatherhood. So in Akkadian, the way to say fathers, plural, is the regular ending. So it would be a beam in Hebrew. It would be a beam. But instead, Hebrew uses the adjective form for some reason. Instead of the plural for father, it uses the adjective plural for father. And that is why it appears to use the feminine ending, even though it's masculine. But so that is evidence that Hebrew actually originates from Akkadian. All right, I've gone on and on. Uh, so, all right, so like I said, any, uh, any other thoughts, any other questions, comments, feedback, criticisms? I hope you guys enjoyed the study today. And I know I shared a lot of information and it might be overwhelming, but I hope you have learned some good stuff. And thanks a lot, Oni, okay? Yeah, and this will be on YouTube. So if you have any further comments, mm -hmm. uh, comment on the YouTube or message me on Facebook. Shalom to you guys. Hope you have a great night. And I'll Bye. See, see you next week, same time. And I will do my best to figure out this YouTube live thing so that next week I can do it live at the same time. All right. Peace, guys. Take, take care. Bye-bye.